Welcome to Pre-Shift, tidbits of wisdom for everyday service. My name is TJ Griffin, and I'm the corporate wine educator for Winebow. Your questions are welcome at any point during this webinar, but please use the Q&A rather than the chat bar to submit them. Let me introduce your host, Master Sommelier Ron Edwards, as a husband, a father, a surfer, and a runner. And, as you'll see, a lover of all things bow tie. He has almost 30 years of experience in the hospitality industry. And since 2018, he has been the director of wine education for Winebow. Here to discuss today's topic, building a wine program, part two, Master Sommelier Ron Edwards. Hello, TJ. Good afternoon to everybody. So good to be back with all of you. So this is part two, Ron. Mm -hmm. We did part one last time, but not everybody may have attended that or seen it yet on YouTube. So could you give us a quick review, a quick recap of part one? I think that's a great idea. And by the way, it is on YouTube. If you missed last episode, you want the precursor, so to speak, just hop on to Winebow YouTube and look for the playlist called Imagine This Pre-Shift. What? All right. So important quick review. Absolutely. Uh, the important factors of a wine program, uh, the First and foremost is that it's a crucial part of hospitality, both experientially as well as financially. And of those two categories, financial outweighs it maybe 51%, 49% kind of thing, because we don't want dollars and cents to run the entire thought process, but it does need to be financially successful. It is part of maintaining profitability and, make, and making sure your hospitality business stays open. Um, you know, and then there's the idea of how does wine fit into the rest of your program, right? Because we're talking about how to build a wine program, but in really what I'm talking about here could be applied to your entire beverage program. How do you build out your bar and what cocktails do you want to focus on or not? What kind of beer list do you want to put together? Is it going to be draft heavy or bottle heavy? You know, all of these things matter. And there's so much of it that boils down into uh, physical space and what is the concept of the restaurant to begin with and all of that. So last time, uh, if you want to go back and look at that, I gave a quick review or um, an, uh, a, a new eye-opening experience to those uh, on in the audience about making money, profitability, cost of goods, um, how they relate to each other, how to start thinking about what does my beverage program, specifically in this case, the wine section of the beverage program need to bring to the table financially. Um, obviously in the hospitality industry, almost everybody talks about cost of goods sold, whereas retail and wholesale talks about margin. They are essentially still talking about profitability, but they're talking about it from a different perspective. And um, they both, they all belong and they have to mix up together. And so that's what the previous session was about. Um, and we're now moving on to uh, what looks like to be hopefully a three-part series, although you can always keep talking about this forever. And this is part two. And we're really going to deal with some foundational concepts about after you figure out your profitability ratios and how does banquet fit into what you're doing or not. Maybe you don't have banquet service. How does um, your buy the glass program have to go financially to balance out whatever your bottle program is. Some of the foundational information that is also informing the previous discussion, but is definitely informing today's discussion is when I was, um, when I was running my own consulting business, we came up with the foundational five P's of hospitality and they are promise, promotion, property, plate, and persona. So I'll give you those one more time. Um, promise, promotion, property, plate, and persona. And everything that we do in a restaurant or hospitality uh, business fits into one of those buckets. And honestly, we really can't achieve any of the four following it unless we have really nailed down what our promise is, which guides all the others. And this is a big deal because the promise is already out there if you're an existing business, whether you know it or not. And the biggest question is whether what the customer thinks you're promising them is what you think you're promising them. And those are very important things to get cohesive and so that you can move on with the other parts and pieces of how it works. And so when you work well with the 
promise, uh, you end up with parts and pieces fitting together. So let's start there. What are you promising? Promise is so critical. And most, as I stated, most hospitality businesses aren't doing a terribly good job with this because it also means that they put a lot of time, energy, and thought into what their concept really was, really is, and how they want it to communicate outside of the building. We think as hospitality professionals that write a menu, build a beverage program, hang a sign on the door, and everybody's just gonna know what to expect when they get here and therefore be happy. And I think what we see on Saturday nights or what we used to see on Saturday nights, now maybe we see in takeout. Um, but as we get back to having guests in our dining rooms, which some markets do have them now, is what the guest thinks about you when they walk in is their expectation. And we often see that guests are unhappy with their experience, mainly because they came in expecting something else. They were expecting fish and you gave them beef. They were expecting fancy and you gave them casual. They were expecting casual and they got there and thought you had to dress up. They were expecting, you know, all American cuisine and you offer Mediterranean. Um, all these things really matter. TJ, am I communicating this well enough? Absolutely. I, I question though about the, the promise. Who, who decides on the promise? Is that the, the owner, the chef, the stakeholders? Is it a team? Is it a committee? It's really going to depend on which business you're talking about, right? So if you're an independent restaurateur or independent hotelier, you as the owner operator need to decide as the big decision maker, it's your, you're the one that went out and raised the money. You're, you're uh, responsible for everything there. You need to sit down and think hard about this and then involve those around you that are going to play part of it to make sure you're all on the same page, making sure that if you said to yourself, I'm going to go out and open a Mediterranean cuisine experience restaurant, right? And then you called it Al's Bistro. There's a big disconnect there, right, TJ? Because the name in and of itself isn't communicating your promise. So it boils to everything, right? Because as soon as you decide what I want the public to think about me before they arrive, now you are getting into what the idea of the promise is. The promise is, for lack of any other words, the expectation the guest has before they arrive. Because even if you don't give them one, they have one with or without your input. So we want to straighten all of that out up front by knowing who we are and then expressing who we are through that process. And so once you decide what your promise is, so um, one of the last restaurants I consulted for was um, the, the promise was that you were going to get Mediterranean uh, cooking style with the influence of the Great Lakes. So we used local produce from around the area. We always had fish from like Lake Superior on the menu, but the recipe and the build out of the dishes was very Mediterranean in its focus with the, the olives and the olive oil and the, and the tomatoes and, and all the things that you would find in the Mediterranean basin. But the Mediterranean basin for that restaurant was all the way to the Near East, you know, uh, Israel, uh, Lebanon, that sort of thing, all the way across uh, it's a little bit of Moroccan food on the menu once in a while, Italian for sure, Greek influence, you know, Southern French, all of that was included, which if you think about Michigan having that really long Lake Michigan coast, it starts to feel like, wow, Lake Michigan is its own sort of Mediterranean. So we, we worked hard on that. And then we uh, started expressing that to the public through the menu style, through the advertising, through the uh, imagery of of all things, and then eventually through the wine program. So, it, but it starts with understanding what you want people to think about before you get there. I worked for another, uh, another consulting job was for a restaurant that did not come to me at the opening. They didn't come to my company then. They came afterwards when they realized that they weren't as successful as they wanted to be. And um, the concept was they were trying to promise the people that they could, that they were going to experience sort of a, a typical, uh, European feel French bistro. And it, the first mistake they made was the name. 
It was called Bistro Fufu. Fufu means crazy, crazy, right? But it meant that everybody in Traverse City, Michigan, mispronounced it as frou-frou, which is a slang for fancy, fancy sort of thing. And so right from the beginning, there was a disconnect in the marketplace just by that one simple thing, by the naming, they caused a problem in the expectations. And so people had, uh, they, they had to work really hard to eventually overcome that and get the public to know when you come here, expect a French bistro, a la carte menu, very classically French cuisine, um, and a classically focused French wine program and spirits program. So that's, that's what, I'm, that's what I'm trying to express. Makes sense. All right. Well, I'm glad it makes sense. Sometimes I get a deer in the headlight book when I bring it up. <laughs> All right. So, so I want to bring up a couple of examples of, of how the promise can play itself out in the way you build out a wine program. And that is that, you know, matching your concept with the promise is part of that other 5P, the plate, right? The beverage program is part of the plate. It falls into that bucket. Um, and so um, one of my friends in um, northern Michigan and her husband and a very talented chef decided they would open a restaurant and they called it Trattoria Stella. TJ, what kind of food does Trattoria Stella sell? Sounds like it might be Italian food. Yes, exactly. So right off the bat, trattoria or trattoria, I'm, I'm never very good with, the, with Italian, um, also suggests not terribly fancy, right? It's not, a, it's not an elegant restaurant uh, as far as its appointments. You wouldn't expect to go there in a formal, uh, informal attire, but then it also sounds like Italian, classic Italian. And that's what they did. And so they took that name. That was their first promise to the customer. And then their entire menu was very clearly handmade Italian cuisine. Um, they talked to their staff about talking to their customers, talk to our customers. When they say, wow, this menu is really interesting. You say, yes, our chef spends at least two weeks a year researching and learning about Italian cooking from Italian chefs. He spends, you know, and so that further propagated the promise through the people who had actually gotten there. And then they spread it around the community, which allowed them to go to this artisan handmade Italian cuisine concept, which then moved them to the bridge that they did whole animal butchery. So whatever was on the menu came in whole, was broken down into various parts and pieces, made into various recipes. And the staff told the customer that. So now that's even more artisan, right? Which allowed them to have a very artisan, very Italian specific restaurant. Now, Traverse City, Michigan happens to be uh, in the middle of one of Michigan's wine countries. So, or wine counties, I guess it would be a better way to say it. So what do you think their new world offerings were dominated by? Old Mission Peninsula and um, Leelanau Peninsula. The wine's right there locally, just like they're sourcing their uh, herbs and vegetables and um, meats from local farmers. So they really got that promise was you're going to drink local except or you're going to drink Italian, but you're going to eat local in an Italian fashion. So they really nailed their promise and they're still going strong today because of it. Uh, on a more national scale, think about Capitol Grill. We know what to expect universally when we walk in a Capitol Grill. They have made this promise. We're going to give you high quality beef and we're going to give you that sumptuous, somewhat masculine dining room environment perfect for business meetings, et cetera, in the, in the current modus operandi of that, which is one of the reasons that they eventually were uh, one of the few national corporate expense account approved automatically business dinners. Fascinating, right? I would have loved to have that at any of my restaurants. Um, and because of that idea, their wine program is reflective, right? It's a, it's a beef heavy restaurant. It's a red wine, heavy wine list. It's it feels like, you know, the American steakhouse. So the wine list has a ton of great American wine on it, as well as international. They don't have to exclusively be American, but they can easily focus on it because the whole feel is, is very American. The French Laundry out in Napa, Michelin three-star restaurant. They have a little help from the Michelin third star to, to recommend, you know, what your experience is going to be. But from the very beginning, the, the French Laundry was about it elevated everything. Now, every detail counts, world-class culinary and dining. Um, this is a lifetime sort of experience. So their beverage program is going to reflect the fact that 
most people coming there are not, it's not a casual night out. This might be the only time they're there in their whole life. So why would we sell you a $50 bottle of wine? We want to start our conversations at a hundred. So they're going to have a much more exclusive feel to their beverage program because it's a special occasion for most people showing up there. So that's some examples of how the promise can play out into the direction you take your beverage program. Ron, um, as far as uh, the promise, you know, in all its facets with the beverage program and, and, the, and the concept and the menu and the food, can, can that evolve over time or are you, do you, will that be asking for trouble? Well, you, if you do it right the first time, it shouldn't evolve, right? Because the concept of the restaurant remains mm -hmm. um, and the promise of the restaurant is the core of the decision-making process. If the changes occur when you feel like you can meet that promise better, if you change this, that, or the other, if you alter this menu item or the entire menu, because you feel like you're wandering from your promise, you, you add uh, a new section to the wine program, for instance, because you feel like your promise, it would be better fulfilled that way. Uh, but to just uproot the promise along the way is definitely means you had it wrong to begin with. or um the the slight modification of it that'd be like you know we're all human we didn't quite hit it perfectly this time sort of like when mm -hmm. when i was consulting with that restaurant in traverse city that really needed to come back to their promise and reevaluate how they express it wasn't so much that the promise was bad they didn't follow it up with promotion and plate and persona they were trying to promise a french bistro in traverse city that's a totally great promise right mm -hmm. pull off um, but they, they missed some of the pieces. So, um, best case scenario, you're not changing your promise. You're changing the other things, the other five P's to fit your promise. You're changing your promotion to make sure you're speaking to your promise. You're changing your property to make sure it reflects what the promise is supposed to be. If you're a casual bistro and you have these lush velvet chairs, that's sort of mixed message, right? If you, um, hire fine dining servers that can't dial it down and your concept is a bistro, the service, the persona won't feel right. On the flip side, if you're promising a high-end dining experience and you have a wait staff that can't dial it up into formal, then you're not living up to the promise there in persona. So all of those, all those little pieces definitely fall together. This, this picture looks like a very specific concept for a restaurant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let me see. What would that be? Hmm. I don't know. Looks like it's all seafood and I don't know. Locally sourced? <laughs> Locally sourced by the one guy. <laughs> <laughs> A very small restaurant, six seats. Whatever I catch in this net is what you eat. All right. So balancing creativity is a big deal. Um, and I see this and I, I went through my own transitions with it and I, I failed at it on many occasions. And so this is near and dear to my heart because if I had fully understood what I was talking about a minute ago with the promise and been more communicative with clients or more communicative with ownership or just make your list about what the promise should be, then I might not have missed the boat, pardon the pun, on the concepts of balancing creativity where your wine list needs to reflect all the things we talked about before. So let's talk about that in the concept of how it boils down to reality. So let's say, uh, taking the picture on the bottom left, I've promised through that picture is supposed to represent sort of an exotic, unusual experience. Pick your topic. Could be a lot of different things in the world, right? But if the people coming in are expecting something new, weird, not weird, that's a bad word, new, exotic, experiential, something they wouldn't do normally on Thursday, that sort of thing, then you have that ability to translate that into your wine program where you can experiment with things that are also along that line. Maybe that's maybe this is the right kind of place to bring in orange wine. Maybe this is the right kind of place to lead, lead the charge with something like, I don't know, grape varieties people haven't really heard of. Um, you know, your glass pour program has things like Petit Mansing in it. And most people are like, what's that? Or instead of showing Pinot Grigio, you refuse and you'll only serve Gruner Veltliner by the glass. Most people, even though Gruner Veltliner is kind of normalized in the U.S. now, 
to not have Pinot Grigio and have that instead as the flavor profile substitution, that's a little bold or, you know, and pick your, pick your favorite thing, um, more Greek wine than most people have, or just go on and down the line, but you have to already have promised them that's that if they expect comfort, like picture on the top, right. And you give them exotic in the wine program, you're going to alienate them at some level. They may get over it and order wine anyway, but it doesn't mean they're happy about it, right? And, and hospitality is to take charge of a guest's happiness for the entire time he's with you. Priyat Savran said that, and it's the ultimate quote on, on hospitality because it is not our job to dictate their happiness. It is to take charge of their happiness, which means we have to bend in some areas where we might not want to. Perhaps you have, let's go up to the top right. You've predicted, you've, you've said to them from the way your sign looks, the name on your restaurant, the way the, the dining room feels, the uniforms, the menu, et cetera, that this is going to be a comfortable, predictable American experience, for lack of a better description, even though that really doesn't have a definition, it does in their minds. Well, if that's the case, then the exotic, unusual wine cannot dominate this list. You might have one or two to challenge people when you can talk to them, especially if you have a sommelier-driven uh, selling methodology. But what they're really looking for in that is stuff they recognize. And so this is the kind of concept where you need to lean on the majors, the major grape varietals, the major producers of those grape varietals that people know and trust. Now, obviously, as we talked about last time, you need to separate yourself. There needs to be a, some sort of barrier between you and everybody knowing exactly what they pay for that on Thursday when they take it home, kind of comfort, but nonetheless, staying with, you know, in the Midwest, for instance, where I moved from most recently, an, uh, an American driven menu, meaning mostly California and Oregon, uh, would be a comfort menu for that uh, guest profile. Whereas you'd have a different comfort menu in Baltimore or even here in Richmond. All right, um, so before we get into uh, really specific concepts on the top left, TJ, anything you wanna add right there? Anything where I've spoken to the year past where you're like, wow, if I had approached this this way, I might've done that instead? Well, especially, I feel like I've been in uh, establishments where the wine list is great and the menu is great, but they don't seem to be on the same page together. Mm -hmm. the, it's a neighborhood bistro, but the wine list is ex completely exotic and doesn't, it sort of outshines the food. And I, I guess that's because they haven't, they haven't gotten together over this, huh? They haven't gotten together over it and decided what the, what the overall experience should be like. And oftentimes there's a lack of understanding on both sides of the conversation, either if it's a chef owned restaurant, sometimes there's a lack of understanding of the, the wine side of it. And there is very often a misunderstanding from the wine buyer's perspective, sommelier or otherwise, as to what makes sense to fulfill the promise. Because they haven't really thought about the promise. They're thinking about what they would like to introduce people to, which is a passion play. And it's not so that it's terrible to follow your passions. But you got to be careful and rein them in. And, and um, especially in big metro areas, I see that a lot in New York where there's this pressure to delineate yourself and your restaurant. And I, I, unfortunately, I feel like it's the yourself that comes before the restaurant in a lot of cases because those wine menus are about the buyer, not the customer. And that's where we have to be really careful. Um, so, but there are times when we can, you know, that exotic, unusual experience is when. You know, the food comes out and it's super unusual. And then you can do that wine list that is about exploration of all the stuff that you wouldn't probably pull off the retail shelf in concept ever. You know, so those, there is a place for it, but it's not in every restaurant. Uh, and so let's talk about the top left screen. That, that plate is just there to re reference the idea of a specific ethnic origin kind of concept where the, you know, a Greek restaurant or at least Greek cuisine, uh, Italian driven cuisine. And even then it would become regional, right? Um, the idea of a French bistro or, or high end French, the idea of something that is, um, latched onto, like it's, 
it says sushi on the building. So you walk in and you know that sushi is part of it and, and Japanese flavors are the rest. It says something Thai on the menu, right? So those are things where the wine program and the beverage program ha can indeed um, jump in and establish the cohesiveness. And I'll go back to that idea of my friends in Traverse City who had Trattoria Stella. They didn't shy away from the fact that they were offering a very um, definitive Italian list to a group of people that, although Traverse Cityites um, are well traveled at the top level of the income bracket, it doesn't mean they know a lot about Italian wine. And so they worked tirelessly in order to fulfill that promise with their beverage program, training their staff. They trained every day, all week, and then they had once a month. All staff must attend live trainings to support the idea that they were going to go full Italian. You know, so it was really, really great. I see that um, uh, Kung Moon has his hand up. Maybe he could pop a chat in for what he's looking for, because uh, uh, I don't know what the question would be. Um, and then there's the, this idea that what about wine bars, right? So. Sometimes you walk into a wine bar, you, you pick up the wine bar menu and you're like, this isn't a wine bar. And sometimes you walk into a bistro or a regular restaurant that you pick it up and go, this is a wine bar menu, but they're not advertising themselves as a wine bar. So uh, keep those things in mind. There's nothing wrong with having an extensive glass program, by the glass program, or feeling like a wine bar when it's not in the title, but may, come back to your promise, right? If people come there expecting a wine bar vibe, then you'll safely have lots of buy the glass program open and keep them fresh and everybody's into it. But if they come there not really expecting a big buy the glass program, you'll end up experiencing a lot of waste or you'll be fighting uphill constantly because you're trying to change expectations after they get in the door, which is much harder. Here's another concept that's really popular right now, right? So the, um, the chef puts on the menu locally, sustainably sourced and organic. Right. And then the, somewhere on the menu is the list of current sources like the farms or the or the farm markets or whatever, where everything is coming from so that people know, hey, your food, your food was fresh before I touched it. Um, I think that's awesome. This is an opportunity in the wine world to go down this path of wines that are also sustainable, green in general, biodynamic, organic. Right. This is a good place for those wines. And. I will say about all of those, you still shouldn't put them on a menu unless they're really good wines. Well-made, high quality, organic wine is amazing. Organic wine for the sake of the organic, that's another question altogether, right? So keep that in mind. That also would be a place, if you wanted to play with natural wines, that's a place to do it. Um, uh, I am admittedly not publicly a fan of natural wine for natural wine's sake, but if you put a wine in front of me that's wonderful and happens to be natural and isn't completely flawed by all the things we try to eliminate by not being natural, I'm in. So we can argue about that at any given time as you wish. All right. Whew. You need to take a breath, TJ. <laughs> well, that was a lot. Um, but I, I, I want to make sure I understand you because you we're talking about specific focus here, but having a clearly defined promise doesn't necessarily mean a narrow focus because you referenced earlier a great concept of Mediterranean, which is uh, allows you a lot of leeway while still having a clearly defined promise. Right. And even in a really specific list, like an Italian wine program doesn't necessarily mean you can't have Burgundy on the list or you can't have California. It just it means that when when people open up your beverage menu, it should reflect what you're trying to say to them about everything else in the building. So if your food is from all over the place, well, that gloves are off and you can be from wherever you want, right? Then it becomes down to a price point. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about now is like, what price point are you targeting with your beverage program? And therefore, what am I selling most of? So first of all, we need, we need to take all that information now and put it into a plan. We have to make a plan because when we don't make a plan, um, things don't turn out right. Um, so you got to ask yourself these questions because I cannot tell you without being in front of you and looking at your program where you should be, but are you going to be a by the glass focused program, the wine bar, 
or are you going to be a buy the bottle focused program, which would be something more like Capital Grill? They they have plenty of wine by the glass, but they really are looking for that you know one hundred and fifty dollar California cab to hit the bot, to hit the table. What is your max and min price point? That's that makes sense, right? So if you're if you're telling the world I'm a casual American bistro, and your wine program starts at bottles of wine at eighty dollars and goes to two hundred and fifty with nothing below, that's a huge disconnect. Or your glass pour program, nothing below fifteen dollars. You know, obviously there's realms to that. Like, oh, but I'm in Disney World. Okay, well that's different. But out in the real world, um, it has to be relative to the marketplace expectation for that promise that you're offering. Um, and what is your average price point that's going to be cohesive with the concept per person average? So a good friend of mine opened a really successful barbecue restaurant that had a great beverage program, but he was very careful. He wanted to make sure year in, day in, year in, year out, that the per person average stayed between $23 and $25 a person. He was adamant because he wanted volume. He didn't want people to think, oh, I can't go back there next week. It was too expensive. Other restaurants are going to need a per person average more like 50 or 70 or 150. It just depends on the restaurant. Your beverage program is going to reflect that. If you need $150 a person out the door, then your average bottle price is going to be more like that first example I brought up, where you're starting in the 80 to 90 to 100 range because you don't want people to spend that. Um, but you do need to always offer something delicious for people who just don't want to spend that kind of money because otherwise you get a lot of negative Yelp and other things. All right. And how often and how quickly can you make changes to the list? I mean, this is a big, big issue in America um, and everywhere else is in the modern world where people's perception is there's a printer in the office. Why is my wine list out of date? We have to absorb that. So making a decision up front, like, well, our concept is going to be the 18 by 24 cardstock that's got all the food on one side and all the wine on the other. It can't be printed in house. It has to be printed outside and we only print them quarterly. Okay, then everything you put on your menu for beverage has to reflect the fact that it has to be available for a quarter at a time without out of stocks to keep everybody going. You don't want to drive your wait staff crazy and you don't want to drive your customers crazy. I always try to put out a wine list that can be printed daily if I needed to, because I want to be able to play with the entire scope of wine for the concept which means that I bought three cases and it was the last three cases and I'm going to sell it and it's gone. I'm going to change the day that it's gone because it's okay to have one thing out of whack on a wine menu. You know, you got a hundred wines on there and one is out of stock today because of a missed delivery or something. But when you get into that two, three, and four, and I am the guy that comes in and I will always order the wine you don't have every time. There's always somebody like me out there. So how often can you make changes to the list is a big deal. And, um, and it will, the more creative your wine list, the more you need to print it in-house. All that makes sense so far, TJ? Absolutely. All right. So as you make your plan, you've got that idea, like what price points am I targeting? Next one is what grapes and regions have to be there and what grapes and regions would you like to be there? Okay, so that's where that, that's a balancing of the creativity, right? It's really difficult in the United States to put a wine program together in any city or town that doesn't have Napa Valley Cabernet on it, right? Because that's just the world in which we live. So you have to consider things like that. It's very difficult to put out a wine menu in America today that doesn't have Pinot Grigio on it somewhere. Even if it's a 100% US list, you still have to grab the grape represented because it's the favorite grape of a lot of people. So, <clears throat> Who's going to sell the wine? Is it going to be sommelier? Like wine steward goes to every table first to sell the wine. Very rare, but it does happen in some places. Well, that's a different kind of list because there's going to be a, an authoritative figure helping the guests go through it. Is it just going to be your wait staff? Is it going to be a combination of the two? All those things really matter because I love selling wine to a guest as a sommelier, but I would so much rather have my entire wait staff enabled to sell wine at will than just me, because everybody will make more money that way. And then the classic question from how many distributors are you willing to buy? TJ, in, in New York, that'd be a lot of people if you decided to put something on from everyone. 
<laughs> 40, 50, 60. I don't know what the. That's a lot. Is. Just in Michigan, I could, I could have done 18 or 20 in Michigan if I counted all the little shops that had like 20 wines or whatever. Um, so there's a realm of, of no return when you have fewer than X wines on your menu, depending on the way you have to buy in your state. You really can't use that distributor anymore because of the minimum order issues um, that are involved. So keep that in mind. It's very important. Um, and this is an example of a plan. This is very basic. You don't have to get all crazy and make a fancy chart. This is just a simple spreadsheet that I would put together as I was building out the program and thinking about what I'd want and start thinking, all right, I got to have bubbles. I got to have Chardonnay. I got to have Sauvignon Blanc. I want to have a Sirtico because it was Medi this is the Mediterranean restaurant. I want to show Vermentino. It's an easy to like Italian varietal. Verdicchio, same thing. I need Riesling because I'm in Northern Michigan for this restaurant. And remember it's focused on the Mediterranean and the Great Lakes. So if I have Riesling, am I just going to do local? Or am I going to do German? There was a decision to make there. Uh, Pinot Gris, there was great local Pinot Gris, but it's Mediterranean. So I'm certainly going to have Pinot Grigio from the Italian spectrum, Greek wine, all that. So all of these things were wish list, right? You put your wish list together. And then you decide how many of each you want. How many Chardonnays do I really need? How many of this do I really need? And at what price point? Super important that as you put together a section of the menu that is the same varietal from multiple places, that you do not cannibalize an individual price point, right? So the $50 Chardonnay needs to stand alone as the $50 Chardonnay, not sitting right next to a $52 and a $53 Chardonnay. If it's a closely approximated price, it's because it's from a different, lesser known region, and you're trying to get people to trade out for the lesser known region for the same price. Uh, I recommend $5 increments on wine lists and not the uh, in between. It took me a long time to get there, but after I changed, I'll, I'll never go back. So, this kind of plan is what you do after you've figured out your promise, after you've figured out your concept really well, who my customers are going to be because of my promise. What kind of price point am I going to put together because of my promise? What kind of grape varieties am I going to show because of my promise? Um, and then you put together the list um, and limit yourself. Most wait staff in a real world training environment cannot handle selling more than 100 wines. No matter how hard you train on it, that's about the max. Customers don't really love wine lists over that 150 mark, except in very specific locations, because it's a very specific guest who's really into wine and willing to wade through the tome that you laid in front of them. Or they just turn to the sommelier that is on duty in places like that and get recommendations. Here's an example of, and I know you can't read it, that's really not the point, but this would be the next part of getting it organized is setting together a spreadsheet or a database that keeps all the important information about everything you sell and things you have taken off the list through the course of time. That's what the red items are on this, on this screen to let you know your history and to sort of keep track of things and making sure that you know what it costs you. If there's a pr particular price offered you to pour it by the glass, that gets recorded alongside of the frontline cost. So that you know how to price it, because you're going to price it on frontline cost, not on the discounted cost. What? And then when you start looking at those bottle costs of goods percentage, those are um, staggered percentages where each one of those uh, is based on the cost of the bottle going in. Uh, so that a $45 bottle would not have the same cost of goods sold percentage as a $12 bottle. So that you can figure out where you're going to end up financially. When you get all that organized and you have that plan together, then we can think about calling a distributor. So just so you know, we still haven't talked to anybody on our side of the business here at Winebow yet, but we're about to. Ron, I, I have a question. This is, um, I guess, you, I guess it's building the wine program. Maybe you've already started, but, but something to think ahead towards, uh, a lot of restaurants will change their menu seasonally mm -hmm. uh, to take advantage of local ingredients and, and have maybe hardier dishes in the winter, lighter dishes in the summer, and the wine list cha uh, changes along with them. How do you plan to change the wine list without getting caught with a lot of extra wine 
or having daily out of stocks or having to print the wine list every half hour? Like, how do you, can you plan that out now? Or is that down the line? I think that you, you, in the back of your mind, as you're dealing with how do I want to run this program? Am I going to alter the wines with the seasons? It makes total sense, right? To have three or five rosés on the menu, two by the glass, five in total or whatever in June, July, and August, but that doesn't make nearly as much sense depending on where you live in what's considered winter. Like you can have rosé on the menu in Florida all year long, but you know, the upper Midwest where I came from, once you got past September, selling rosé got a little challenging. So yes, there's going to be those things. And so you have to plan for them by here's my replacement. If there is one, here's how much I have left. Communicate with the wait staff, right? We're selling out of this. Um, it will run out sometime this week. We will reprint the menu once it's gone. And then there's another strategy. Uh, if you're printing a menu yourself and it's a multiple page menu where you can slide pages in and out. What I did for a long time was I had a one bottle left list and anything that was really low in inventory. Sometimes I put three bottles there cause it sold faster that I wasn't going to replace. I would move to the, you know, the get it while you can list, so to speak. And I put that up towards the front of the menu where people would see it before they went looking for their normal stuff. And also so that the wait staff had an easy out. If somebody ordered something from there, they could automatically say, I'll check to see if it's here, have a backup in case, you know, it was, it was good. It was a good policy for that particular restaurant. And I think it would work in a few others too. A chalkboard program is also a really good place to get rid of or take care of those uh, in and out issues during, um, during menu changes. The one bottle left page. That's a, that's a good idea. I wish I had thought of it myself, but I didn't. Where were you? <laughs> it was in Northern <laughs> Michigan, a little place called Tapawingo back then. All right. Well, if we don't have any other questions, I would like to invite everybody to come back on November 3rd at the same time, 3 p.m., for the third part of building a wine program. Will we be calling the distributors at that point, Ron? Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Won't we? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the there you go. You have to come back to find out. Yeah, the distributors are certainly hoping that we're eventually going to call them. And, and, and yes, I know what November 3rd is. And everybody is going to need a little distraction from politics at that point. So tune in anyway, regardless of the fact that that's election day. Um, if it's anything like Virginia, I can go vote today. I don't have to wait for the third anyway. So uh, be well, everyone. Thank you for attending. Bye, everyone.